Hello, everybody. Knock twice if you can hear me. Apparently, it takes a little while for things to come through. But if you want to chat to me, you can type them into the comments and I will talk back. So I'm just going to sit back for a little while and have my wine until you all join me. Uh, for anyone who's just logging on, my name is Emma Viskic and there will be a quiz later on on how to pronounce my surname and the winner gets a round of applause. <laughs> so if anyone's joining about now, I'm going to be chatting here for about half an hour tonight. Uh, you can ask me anything you like about my books, about oh, life in general, if you'd like. Um, I will be talking about my latest book, Those Who Perish. And I'll um, also be talking about my, my first three novels a little bit, uh, the first of which was uh, is Resurrection Bay. So whether you've read uh, my novels or not, feel free to chuck those questions in there and I will answer anything you like. And I'm just going to give everybody a few seconds um, to, to join in and make sure your internet's uh, working and make sure you got your wine. <laughs> and then I'm going to give a little bit of a rundown on the types of books I write and why I write them and um, some of the inspiration behind what I do. But the first thing I'm going to do is, as people join, just talk you through the day I've had and why I've started my dinner with a glass of wine instead of the soup that's waiting for me in the kitchen. So anyone who's observant may see this little uh, bandage. Hello, we've got a few people joining us. Wow, from Wagga. I love Wagga. Wendy and Alicia from Demery, Sue, who is reading Resurrection Bay now. Awesome. It's my first novel. Thank you. So as people are joining you, I'm just going to tell you a little horror story about fingers and people who need all their fingers to type, which is that one of the most dangerous things you can do as a writer is cook your daughter a birthday dinner of cannelloni, would you believe? So trigger warning here for anyone who's a bit squeamish with blood. A couple of nights ago, I was chopping up onions and sliced off a good chunk of my finger and fingernail. So um, I'm a little bit uh, a little bit cack-handed tonight. Uh, as I was coming back from getting this dress today with the doctor on the way here to chat to you all, I left my phone on the roof of the car. <laughs> the car made it all the way home with the phone on. So I got in and I promptly dropped it in the bath. So we're starting with wine tonight. Cheers. I hope you've all got one. Um, I have got a very average Pinot Grigio. So I hope you've all got something to, to get you through your evening. Who have we got here? We have got, oh, the Fleur. Now, I never know how to pronounce it, Wendy. Flurio Peninsula. I keep saying it written and I have never. That's Wendy. Hello. I've never heard it pronounced. So at some stage, I'm going to have to Google that. Uh, yes, you should definitely have some wine. Hi, Marge, and hi, Hannes. Yes, it was a great day. This is, um, I'm actually, I'm going to say, a little bit accident prone. So if anyone uh, ever wants to feel better about the day you've had, just join me over on Twitter where I usually give an update on the accidents I've had each day. Oh, Envelop, love Envelop too. Um, so Susan has got an average Sauv Blanc. Cheers. We can both have our very average wine. The um, second cheapest wine in the shop is what they uh, they call it. And we've got, hi, Christine from Ballarat. So I'm just going to um, introduce you a little bit uh, to the, the books that I write. Um, I actually have written a, a series of four books featuring a private investigator called Caleb Zellick. Um, I write them, I, I try and write them so that you can read them as standalone. So those who perish, I know a lot of people have read this having not read my other novels and have jumped straight in. But I've also written them for people who like to really get into um, the, the, the headspace of a character. If you like to, have, um, to follow characters' emotional growth and, and characters who change, 
uh, you start with Resurrection Bay and move your way around um, through them. But if you just like to jump in, just jump in with those who perish. Um, oh, we've got someone from the Northern Rivers area of New South Wales. I love it. And Perth. Well, now you're just showing off because I'm meant to be in WA right now. So <laughs> maybe I'll make it over soon and we can, um, we can uh, have, a, have a wine over in WA. Um, oh, and Deborah has got an average Pinot Grigio as well. Ah, oh, cheers, Deborah. They're the best. So as I was saying, Those Who Perish is the fourth novel um, of my Caleb Zellick crime novels. And I'll just tell you a little bit about Caleb, who is my protagonist. Um, Caleb is a standard PI in some ways. He's, he's fit, he's a young man, he's very uh, stubborn and he's also profoundly deaf. So in order to write Those Who Perish and all of the novels, I've, I've obviously done a, a lot of research. I mean, I hate to say the word research because it sounds a little bit uh, clinical, but, um, but I have. I, I've learned um, Auslan and that's Australian Sign Language and I tried to learn lip reading and failed terribly. So if we've got time later on, I'll tell you about some of the terrible uh, experiences I had trying to um, lip read in the world. Oh, somebody has got a very bad, what was it? A cheaper, <laughs> a cheaper uh, glass of wine from Susan. <laughs> the girlfriend buys you wine. Oh yeah, for books. It's an excellent, excellent idea. So um, if you've got any questions at all, just pop them into the chat and I will um, answer them um, as I see them. And if I happen to miss them, just put them in again um, because it's very, very possible that I, I miss you um, as I go. So I'll just talk you through a little bit. So Those Who Perish um, is set in Victoria and it's set in a little fictional town down on the coast, uh, down in, in, on the western coast of Victoria. And it's partly set in the town of Resurrection Bay, which is Caleb's hometown, because I love a hometown uh, novel. And I love writing about small country towns. I've lived in them. I've got families, you know, down in the western region. And I love the absolute claustrophobia of having a really tightly held knit community where everybody knows each other. They know each other's secrets. They know their failures. They know um, everything about them. And um, that that wonderful sense of um, community, but also how things can go terribly wrong. And in a lot of ways, uh, I think uh, Those Who Perish is about homecoming. But I wanted it to be even more claustrophobic than a small town. So I've actually set the novel just off the coast of Resurrection Bay in a small island called Muttonbird Island. Um, I've just got a quick question here from Deborah, who asks, do you need to read your books in order? No. No and yes is the answer, actually. So no, uh, definitely a lot of people have read um, Those Who Perish and the other novels jumping straight in. And you, I, I try and thread enough backstory through the opening chapters so that if you've never read the other ones or maybe it's been a few years since you've read the earlier novels, you, you can get enough information. But as I was saying before, if you're the sort of person who really likes going on a long journey with a character and seeing them grow and change and seeing how much I can torture them, then you might enjoy starting with Resurrection Bay and reading them through. But um, plot-wise, you can just jump in at any book if, if you like. Um, and we've got Hannes saying, loved all the books, really loved, ah, oh, recognising all the uh, Melbourne spots. Any chance Resurrection Bay is a real place? And the island? Uh, yes and no. Resurrection Bay, uh, Caleb's hometown, is, I, I think, inspired by a lot of places I have lived in, visited over the years, a small town um, where you can recognise a lot of people. If you've ever lived in a small town, you can recognise certain aspects of it. Uh, the grog shop that everybody knows, um, the neighbour who is always watching everybody, uh, the really um, kind uh, cafe, uh, 
for staff, but just those those people that you you can recognise in 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 small towns. Um, but the town itself of Resurrection Bay is completely made up, um, mainly because I'm scared of uh, people getting upset if I write about their own towns, but also because it gives me absolute freedom to do anything I like with them. The island of Muttonbird Island, which you can just see on Sandy Cole's beautiful, beautiful cover, um, that was inspired by a real island in Port Phillip Bay in Victoria called French Island. It's a completely different island. And if you're from French Island, this is not based on you, not based on your community. Um, but French Island is its own little um, system. There is no uh, governance there. Cars are unregistered. There's no town water. There's no electricity. Uh, and when I went there um, for the first time five or six years ago, I thought this is perfect. Uh, I can put Caleb off on an island where uh, things get tenser and tenser. Um, and in the case of those who perish, uh, I want to make it really tense. So I've got a sniper on the island um, picking people off. And uh, when Caleb first gets there, uh, he's got no idea why or what's happening. So to put you in the place of the book, and there's no spoilers here because it's in the first line, Caleb arrives back in his hometown of Resurrection Bay because he's got uh, an anonymous message that his wayward brother has turned up after being missing for ages and he discovers that his brother is actually, a little bit of a spoiler, on the island. Uh, and um, I think it's probably safe to say that things are rapidly downhill from then. So, yes, Mutton Bird Island isn't a real island, but I think we can safely say inspired by a, a real um, island. And we have got from Glenda, what is the order of the book series? So the very first novel um, is Resurrection Bay, which is easy to remember because that's uh, the name of the town. The next one is And Fire Came Down, which is very much about the after effects of um, the events of Resurrection Bay. It's about trauma, it's set in a heat wave, there are fires lit, deliberately lit. Um, so it's it's got that, you know, uh, burning claustrophobic feel again. The third novel is Darkness for Light. Um, and actually I won't say anything about that one because I don't want to give any spoilers. And the most recent one is uh, Those Who Perish. We have got a question from Lydia who is asking what made you decide to have the main character as profoundly deaf i enjoy reading the series and learn learning how he walk works around his disability which opens our eyes to issues we may not be aware of i really like the other characters who are marginalized oh thanks lydia that's, that's really lovely uh, it was a really interesting process um with caleb's deafness um it i didn't set out i didn't think oh I'm going to write a deaf character. It happened very organically and naturally over a number of years. Um, I can look back to my very, very first published novel. Sorry, not novel, a uh, short story when I was 12. It was uh, published in a little, um, it was the education department's Pursuit magazine and it was a short story. And it was about a man who was blind. So, and I've got these little characters all through my childhood writing um, about outsiders, I think you could probably call them. It, it, there was a girl who was mute, someone who was invisible. Um, and in writing, we called this a theme, not therapy. <laughs> so um, I think I've always been drawn to characters who are not quite fitting into the mainstream and are observing it a little. So it's come from there. Partly, I guess, because I was a very odd child myself, um, you know, always off daydreaming, um, and partly because my grandparents uh, didn't speak English. Um, I, they, they were Croatian immigrants. I don't speak Croatian. Very common, you know, back then not to, um, you know, be learning the language of your, of your family, family's origins. Um, and they actually came to live with us when I was seven or so. And because, um, yeah, Barbara and Dita couldn't speak English, I can speak Croatian, that, that um, clash of not being able to communicate and seeing how comfortable they were in their community, like Caleb's comfortable in the deaf community, but also how hard 
things were for them in the wider community is exactly how things are for Caleb. Um, and Caleb doesn't have a problem with his deafness. He has a problem with some people's attitudes to his deafness. So all these things sort of layered into the novels. And I have to say, uh, as a crime writer, having a lead character who is deaf is um, fantastic uh, because he doesn't know who's creeping up behind him. He can miss information. He lip reads. So he can miss things. So that's actually made things easier. I thought it would make things much, much harder. I, um, I was actually so nervous about writing Caleb's character that when I was first writing Resurrection Bay, the first novel, um, I, I put the manuscript away for six months. I thought it would be too hard to, um, to do it justice, to do it correctly. And I love dialogue. My, my first career was as a, a classical musician, a clarinetist. Uh, I'm very tuned in uh, orally. If I'm in a room with you, I'm 100% eavesdropping on your conversation, but I'm not very visually observant. So I, I was worried about that. I was worried about um, hurting people in the deaf community. So I, I did actually put the manuscript aside for, yeah, a good six months or so. Um, but sometimes as a writer, you just get these characters who are just in your head. They've been in your head so long. Um, so when I eventually went, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to do this, that's when I... I threw myself into talking to people in the deaf community, in the hard of hearing community, reading books, trying to learn to lip read, um, putting foam earbuds in my ears and going out and trying to catch buses and trains and ordering long blacks in cafes and getting coffee with cream in by accident, which and that scene actually makes it into Resurrection Bay, the first one. I rarely put real life events in, but that one <laughs> definitely uh, made it in. I've um, got another question from Hannes. Is the rehab hotel on French Island? That would be fun to see. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> so uh, in Those Who Perish, um, there, it's, there is um, a group of islanders who are very much uh, their own community and don't warm to outsiders. And within that island, there is a rehab clinic. And that rehab clinic is slightly based on a real place. Um, French Island actually did have a prison um, on it for many, many, many years. Uh, it almost became uh, an aged care place. <laughs> uh, and I like the idea of this little separate place, but I didn't want to make it a prison compound. And near the real French Island, there's also... Um, a quarantine hospital down Point Nepean, which is a very old quarantine hospital. So I've sort of combined them and made it a, a, a slightly different rehab. Um, and I started that all before the pandemic. So once the pandemic started, I actually had to take a lot, lot of the stuff out about the quarantine hospital because I thought, um, I don't want to read about quarantining and things at the moment in, in the middle of a Melbourne lockdown. Well, let's just take a lot of that information um, out. So it's still a quarant an old quarantine hospital, but rest assured uh, there's nothing about coronavirus or um, anything like that in there. Um, so for those of you who have just joined us, um, pop any questions in the chat, whether you've read the books or not, and I will do my absolute best to answer them. Um, and we've got Lydia... Thanks for explaining the context of the outliers in terms of creation heritage, earlier stories. Oh, thank you. Characters are really engaging. Um, thanks heaps, Lydia. That's, that's a lovely comment. I love writing characters. It's my absolute favourite thing. So although um, there's a lot of plot in my books, I, I plot the whole way through. I, I'm just always plotting. Um, the reason the plot bit is there, I, I think of that as being the car. It's taking you on a really exciting journey, but it's the people in the car that I'm really, really interested in. So when I'm writing, I'm very much in the characters' heads and seeing the world, particularly in Caleb's head. Um, so I, I'm really, really drawn as a reader to writing, uh, to reading character-based books as well because it is, it's, it's the characters I'm, I'm really interested in. I'm really interested in people. I, I want to know 
how they think. Uh, I'm always people watching. And I think that's one of the main reasons I write is that, um, yeah, I want to make sense of the world. I want to uh, know why people do terrible things, why they do good things. Uh, so a crime novel for me is the absolute easiest, best, deepest way of doing that. And, you know, you can have some fun while you do it as well. I've got a few more questions. I'm just going to read them. Um, another one from Hannes. Why write a male character, not a female character? Great question. I was actually cross that he was male to begin with. <laughs> so I grew up with, um, I guess as a, a later teenager, with fantastic uh, female crime writers, um, the, the, the V.I. Warshawski series and um, Cat Colorado, all of those great, you know, really strong female characters. And I always thought when I wrote a novel, I would have this really strong female character and, and Caleb turns up instead. And I actually tried to make him female for a while. And it took me a little while so to work out why it didn't work. And it's, I always start with instinct with writing. I, I just write what feels right. And then as I rewrite and rewrite and rewrite, I often work out why. And in Caleb's case, um, having a, an almost invincible figure of a fit young man who can go anywhere in the world, but giving him a vulnerability was a beautiful contrast. Whereas when I tried to make um, the character female and death, I felt that it made the character too vulnerable. So I didn't have that contrast because it is physically more dangerous for a female PI, going down dark alleyways, going into places in bars and dealing with bikies. I just felt that instead of having contrast, I was doubling down on things. And for me, in writing or music or anything, it's all about contrast. It's having dark moments and then funny moments and having uh, really exciting chase scenes and then having a quiet moment. So I really love to... Um, get the balance of, of, of everything. So in a nutshell, that's why Caleb became a man. Um, so I love the idea of plot being a car. Excellent. Thank you, Julie. Yes. <laughs> it's because um, I do. I love plot. And, and you know what? Sometimes you just want to pick up a book and, and enjoy the ride and not be in your world. Um, but it does take me a long time to write a book. It, it, you know, it took me a good two years to write Those Who Perish and that's like writing around the clock because I do get a bit obsessive. So in order to really enjoy that, that's when I you know, get really inside the, um, the characters' heads. And I, I do actually like being inside Caleb's head, even though um, it getting pretty dark at times. But it's quite nice um, being a character for a little while who's incredibly brave and doesn't chop his finger off making cannelloni for his daughter's birthday. Um, that's fun. Uh, I, it's, it's nice to be a coordinated person for a little while while I write. Um, Beck Brown, your series has been very popular with the teachers in our school. Oh, awesome, Beck. Thank you. Um, to my surprise, uh, all of the novels, particularly Resurrection Bay, that's the first one, uh, are in high school libraries, which I wasn't expecting because... There's a, I got to say, quite a lot of language in it, as in swearing. Because, um, well, Caleb's a bit of a swearer, but I got to say, so am I, uh, absolutely. Um, and there's some, there's some pretty full-on fight scenes, but um, I think they're always in the the senior section of the library. I'm hoping, anyway. Definitely not for primary school um, kids. From Lynn Kelly, uh, that's a really interesting question. Do you read many other novels? Yes. I have always got a book on the go. I read. I've always been a huge reader. Um, the hardest thing, actually, the last couple of years is um, just pandemic, world, lockdown, wrecked my reading brain for a little while and I had to sort of retrain myself to concentrate for longer periods of time. So it's been, um, it's been lovely the last couple of months. I finally got back into my reading. Um, but I read everything. Uh, I read poetry, nonfiction, crime, literary, everything except for horror, um, which just to set the scene, when I got home today, I don't know why this happened. 
I got into the bedroom and this was on the bed. <laughs> I've been carrying around with me ever since. I've got no idea. Anyway, I screamed. There was literal screams coming out of my mouth because, yeah, I can't do horror. It absolutely um, scares me. <laughs> um, Yvonne Luckers said, loved VI. Yeah, that's VI Wachowski. Read the years ago. Yeah, great um, series set in Chicago by Sarah Peretsky. And, and I think in some ways reading her books probably set me off writing crime fiction. Before that I was... I was writing manuscripts, just trying to find my way into uh, what sort of books I wanted to write. So before my first novel, Resurrection Bay, was published, I wrote two like full-length manuscripts that will never be published, Burn Upon My Death, um, and they were sort of nothing really, um, but the elements that worked really well were the crime elements, and I sort of I thought I love reading that sort of stuff, so I think I'm, you know, going to do them. Um, Becky's saying the books are in senior fiction. Excellent. <laughs> ah, and your school also has a deaf facility. Yep, yep. I do get um, a lot of emails and things from deaf and hard of hearing people, which I, I love. I love getting. Um, and, and I'm still learning Auslan, so I'm sort of, you know, um, still talking to people and, and, and hearing more stories. Uh, and the great thing about the deaf community is it's, so based on story storytelling is so huge you meet someone um, my Auslan is still it's not fluent nowhere near fluent but I can just be mesmerized by someone telling a story in Auslan it's the most uh engaging thing to to watch and be part of it's brilliant um we are going to be wrapping up in just a minute so if you've got a last question put that into the chat um and so and, and then I'll let you all go and have your um your wine and your and your meals. Uh, otherwise, um, I oops, one more. Deb saying she was the same in lockdown. Um, couldn't read. Lots of Netflix, yeah. Well, start reading, start reading. <laughs> uh, my last question is from Hannes again. I get really attached to all the characters and want them to end up happy. Do you struggle with having bad things happen to them? Yes and no. Um, I, I like torturing my characters. I'm a very, very cruel person. When I find myself getting too nice to my characters, that's when I know I need to step back and be nasty again because the most boring thing is people sitting around in a book talking to each other in cafes, being nice to each other. <laughs> Having said that, they are nice to each other sometimes because I also don't want to write monsters. It's my last one. Thank you. Excellent. No, just thank you. Thank you all so much. It has been lovely um, chatting to you a little bit online. Um, love to see you at a talk sometime. Otherwise, enjoy your reading. Enjoy your wine. And um, have a lovely evening, everybody.